everybody. I hope you had a lovely weekend. Welcome to the new week. I'm Jeremy Cordo. Peter Clayton is with us, and we're very glad that you are either watching us on Facebook or you're listening to us on a podcast, which um, I hope is coming through loud and clear. Um, happy birthday if you're having a birthday before we get on to the events of the day, and boy, <laughs> we've had a few. <laughs> but where would we be if we didn't have stuff to talk about in the court of public opinion. Where would we be? Where would we be? Cyclone Larry makes landfall in Eastern Australia 2006. There have been so many cyclones I can't really remember Larry but uh, it destroyed most of the country's banana crops. It did terrible damage but you know, you pick yourself up and you dust yourself off, particularly people on the land, quite used to overcoming adversity. 2006. Oh, Vera Lynn. I loved Vera Lynn. Uh, she died in 2020, and I think she was a hundred and something, I can tell you. Uh, she was over a hundred. She was born in 1917. Uh, Lady or Dame Vera Lynn, British popular music artist, the faces or the forces, sweetheart they called her. We'll meet again the White Cliffs of Dover, born in London this day in uh, 1917. David Warren, Australian scientist and inventor, and boy we are good at this invention stuff. He invented the flight data recorder, the cockpit voice recorder, the black box, which of course is not black, it's actually um, orange, if you've seen one. Uh, he um, died in 2010, but he was born in 1925, an Australian invention. Uh, I know there were people in the medical world who were looking to the technology, the black box technology, into operating theatres. Not so much to accuse people when things went wrong, but just basically to find out what went wrong. But unfortunately, the medical profession didn't want a bar of it. Uh, make of that what you will. I hope no one's going in for surgery today. <laughs> No, I'm sure it'll be all right. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. Malcolm Fraser, whose picture hangs over there in an interview we did with him on 5AA. I can't remember how long ago it was, but Malcolm was born 1950. No, um, he dies at 84. Uh, he was Liberal uh, leader from 75 to 83, and he died 2015 on this day. General, uh, General Douglas MacArthur vows, I came through and I shall return. I'm familiar with the I shall return bit, but apparently he said, I came through and I shall return after escaping Japanese controlled Philippines in 1942. There's a picture somewhere of uh, General Douglas MacArthur at the Adelaide Railway Station with his wife and his son. Um, very historic picture, that. Uh, Kenny Rogers, we mentioned his birthday just the other day. This is the day that he died, 2020. It's amazing the number of people who die on or around their birthday. Uh, it, it is a thing. It is definitely a thing. Kenny Rogers. Kenny Rogers, the gambler. All sorts of other great songs. Loved his voice. It had a certain timbre about it. Great singer. A nice man to talk to as well. American fast food restaurant chain KFC, Kentucky Fried Chicken, is founded by Colonel Harland Sanders, North Corbin, Kentucky. North Corbin. I'm not sure where that is. Pete, you're in the travel world. What, where's North Corbin? <laughs> no, I haven't heard of it either. Kentucky sort of south. Yeah. South yeah. Well, he was never a colonel, you know. He, he, was, he looked like a colonel. <laughs> so they made him a colonel. Why not? The Black Death. 
Oh yes, the Black Death, Saturn, Jupiter and Mars, the planets in conjunction. On this day in 1345, the conjunction of those planets was blamed for causing the plague, the Black Death. Suppose you have to blame someone. British Beatle John Lennon, 28, Wedge Japanese artist Yoko Ono, 36, in Spain. Uh, his second marriage, her third. That was in 1969. London's famous Burlington Arcade opens, the world's first shopping arcade. And a funny little piece of trivia, whistling was banned. You couldn't whistle in the arcade. It was against the law. That was in 1819, believe it or not. Um, Alessandro Volta reports his discovery of the electric battery in a letter to Joseph, later Sir Joseph Banks, who was president of the Royal Society of London. And the year was 1800. Volta, hence we get the vault, the name we all are familiar with. And as predicted, <laughs> as predicted by the Simpsons, no less, in 2019, the Walt Disney Company acquires Rupert Murdoch's 21st century Fox entertainment business for $71 billion. There's no doubt about it, those Simpsons were smart. <laughs> and <clears throat> one more, Carl Reiner, American comedian, actor, screenwriter, uh, the Dick Van Dyke show, uh, of the whole list of them. Wonderful man of uh, entertainment. He did the jerk, <laughs> lots of things. I won't, I won't go through them all. But he was <clears throat> born in the Bronx, New York. He died 20 20, but he was born on this day in 1922. Happy birthday, as I say. How about this? Time magazine has revealed the world's greatest place for 2023. Speaking about travel, where would you reckon? Now, you've been around the world more times than most people can think about it. Pete, what's the world's greatest place? Well, USA for me. USA for you. Yes. But no particular part? Well, the Midwest. <laughs> the Midwest. Well, <laughs> according to Time magazine, the world's greatest place for 2023, and it's the only Australian destination to be on the list, the only one, and it happens to be here in South Australia. Pete? <laughs> South Australia? Do you know where it is? Well, I'd say the Flinders Rangers, but I'm biased. No. Flinders Rangers? No. Kangaroo Island? Yes. Okay. Kangaroo Island, that's quite an accolade. The only Australian spot to make the Time magazine world's greatest places for 2023. I don't know what land over there costs, but it might just jump a little bit after this. And another, another number one for South Australia, a $26 bottle of Clare Valley Chardonnay has been named the best wine in the world. Judged against 7,500 wines from around the globe, South Australian wineries won a total of 43 awards, but this $26 bottle produced by Clare Valley's Taylor's Wines beat them all. Michael Taylor, you must be very, very proud of them and your company and your winemakers. Wow, you should be proud too. A total of 43 gold medals collected by Australian wineries and all of them from South Australia. Great. Uh, Betty says, did you see the radio ratings last week? Yes, Betty, I did. I did. No, and 5AA did not ring me. I kind of thought they might have, <laughs> but no. Uh, it would appear it's the only talk station in Australia, in all the capital cities, uh, to not be a clear number one. It's a great pity, really, great pity. Looking at these unemployment figures, the Australian economy is terrifically robust, resilient, 
And when you look through all the statistics, I cannot see how the Reserve Bank can possibly not put the interest rates up next month. A lot of people were saying they're going to put them on hold. But when you add into that mix what's going on in the banking world, I think we have to expect that the Reserve Bank will be very cautious about another interest rate rise, but they've got to do what they've got to do. The banks are around the world, not just in Australia, but around the world, they are much more highly capitalised than they were at the time of the global financial crisis. I would think their lending practices and policies would be a lot more cautious, a lot more conservative. All of these are very good indicators that we will not have any major trouble in the financial world, fingers crossed. But the Reserve Bank here in Australia would not want to exacerbate things by putting those interest rates up without an uh, awful, awful lot of thought, consideration. Let's talk about that press club lunch in um, Canberra last week. Wednesday, I think it was. The worst deal in all history. The AUKUS submarine deal is the worst international decision taken by government since the conscription in World War I. So says Paul Keating. Paul Keating. He belittled the Prime Minister, the Foreign Minister and the Deputy Prime Minister. Quite scathing. Paul, why didn't you tell them what you really thought? <laughs> dear, oh dear. Now, look, I respect Paul Linkson. Uh, oh, he was my old boss. It's force of habit. I respect Paul Keating. A self-made man. I don't altogether understand his anger and fury. And I certainly don't understand his vision of the modern world or the present day world. China is not some big cuddly panda bear. He says China does not represent a threat to Australia. He ignores the Spratly Islands, he ignores the sabre rattling, the biggest military expansion since World War II, the Chinese warships lurking off the coast of Australia, the trade sanctions against us, the treatment of the Uyghurs in China, the bullying of Chinese students here, and we know about it in Adelaide particularly. No, they are behaving, the Chinese, in a very belligerent way, which would give any reasonable person cause for concern. Now, he had his go, Paul Keating, the highest office in the country, but he certainly let fly at the press club. I thought it was kind of, I don't know, undignified. Uh, another word that came to mind was bitter. I think he's probably suffering from relevance deprivation. But probably he's like a lot of people in the Labour Party. Not all, but a lot. He's behaving like a bully. But then again, he always was a bit of a bully. He was arrogant. I remember as treasurer when he brought in that fringe benefits tax. Ordered to do so by someone, I think, the unions, jealousy, envy. He said to me uh, in a radio interview, he said to me, I'll get the words exactly, he said to me, when I was talking about these people in the restaurant trade who'd probably be out of work because of this tax, and I had a restaurant at the time, which I made mention of, but he said, I would rather have people moving paper around a doll queue than moving plates around a restaurant. We are better than that. Well, some of the finest people I've known in my life have been waiters and waitresses. I'm sorry, I think that's a very snobbish thing to say. I think Paul's a social, political, 
and cultural snob who collects very expensive French clocks. He was most disparaging about the left of his party, Anthony Albanese and Penny Wong, and I must say they handled his remarks with dignity, great dignity. But it's largely cause and effect, and we shouldn't forget that. I'm talking about all this stuff with regard to China. It's almost paranoia. We helped to create modern day China. China would not be such a problem except largely for the people, including Australia, who signed this Lima Declaration. This is where we all agreed, all these countries got a, a, around a table and agreed to shift manufacturing from first world countries to third world countries. China being one of those, a big one. At the time we signed, or more correctly Gough Whitlam signed us up to that declaration, China was basically a peasant economy. Basically a peasant economy. More likely to ask for aid than anything else. China didn't get to where it is today without a lot of hard work and a lot of help from countries like Australia. Please, cause and effect. Understand where it all began. Understand we have to take some responsibility for the monster that we helped create if, and I say it again, if China is a monster. Just let's remember how it all began. Um, a question. Uh, Pete, you might know this. What was the rock band, the rock group that Paul Keating used to manage before he got into politics? Do you know he was a he was the manager? No, I didn't. He did. Yeah. Have a think about it. Uh, no, no, no doubt somebody will message me with it. Somebody will remember. You don't know. No, I do remember. Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> we'll see, see if other people want to research it or maybe spontaneously know it. I don't know. On the subject of the uh, submarine deal, it's interesting how the media is treating Anthony Albanese, Defence Minister Richard Miles and the government generally. Uh, over the whole thing. It's forensic demand for expl explanation. Explain, explain, explain. Details. Why do we need to spend $368 billion? Why do we need eight submarines? Who is going to crew them? Will there be Americans? Will we have Australians on American subs? What about Taiwan and the implications for Australia and those atomic submarines if China invades Taiwan? Questions, questions. But when it comes to the voice, the Aboriginal voice to Parliament, the Prime Minister is given a dream run. He asks us to trust him. Just vote yes. Nothing to worry about. Nothing. I'll give you the details later. And the media gives him a bit of a wink and a nod and moves on. No please explain, no close questioning, no forensic searching of the ins and the outs. No. Why, I wonder? Why? The proposed referendum should be subject to the closest scrutiny. Changing the constitution is much more important than military procurement that goes forward 50 years. Something there just doesn't quite add up. I remember just quickly before I leave you one question we asked some weeks ago, I gee well must be three at least three weeks ago. I asked, why doesn't somebody take Putin to the International Criminal Court? He is an established war criminal. There's certainly enough evidence there, prima facie. Well, I see over the weekend, somebody has 
Somebody has. And the court has issued a warrant for his arrest. Brilliant. But there's a catch. <laughs> like the United Nations, where the bad guys have the same right of veto as the good guys. That's over anything and everything, by the way. It seems the International Criminal Court is very much the same. They can't touch you unless you are a signatory or a member to this treaty. And guess what? Russia is not a signatory. Neither is America, neither is China. A lot of people haven't signed that one. I wonder what they're frightened of. <laughs> the whole exercise was probably expensive but quite meaningless. With the other interesting thing being that when Putin started this war it was because he wanted less NATO countries breathing down his neck and he was worried that he was going to find his nearest neighbour signed up to NATO. Now, his behaviour is only going to get him more because Finland and Sweden, these are two countries, very strategic countries for Russia, who have announced they are really keen to join that club. So Putin, through his behaviour, has got not less NATO, but he has in fact got more NATO around him. Thank you very much for viewing, ladies and gentlemen, of the Court of Public Opinion. Pete and I will be back. Have a great day. Believe in yourself. I'm Jeremy Cordo. Thank you for viewing.